Hello everyone and welcome to the Crumbs Podcast, where we pick up the pieces of whatever's left behind. So today's episode or segment is going to be very interesting because it's going to be about science. And also us going down the psychological rabbit hole. Yeah. We know that science has given us amazing breakthroughs, but we also know that science isn't always ethical. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And some psychology breakthroughs have yielded some horrifying results. And sort of the scope of this experimentation, especially those who use human subjects, are obviously clearly changing, especially now, because behavioural data is so cheap and so willingly shared by millions of people, including us. I think that's interesting because we kind of share our information and the way we think by answering our questionnaires and filling out surveys online. I mean, even when we buy what's popular and we do our online shopping, it's all documented. Yeah. And a lot of companies actually have access to our cookies and stuff. So we unwillingly and unknowingly kind of give all these sacred information away. I mean, it is sacred to a behavioral psychologist. It's absolute goal it's like when you google like oh i want this sort of backpack and then it comes up as an instagram ad that still sort of counts as tapping into like psychology and sort of abusing that or manipulating that to get something out of you or to learn something about human nature and this has been done before yeah i mean a few years back what happens with facebook yeah yeah a academic and psychologist alexander kogan He created this app which consisted of, you know, questionnaires and surveys. And then he kind of collected that information of over 80 million people. The scope is enormous and just kind of sold it to Cambridge Analytica for behavioral research. So that's scary for someone to be able to do that, even though he was caught. So a psychological experiment basically without our consent. Of over 80 million people, like taking their personal information and sharing it with a company that wants that information. But today our focus will not just be on psychological or behaviour experiments that went wrong or you know, had really scary effects or how they were extremely unethical, but also what those studies actually tell us about not just the human mind, but sort of how our society functions in certain aspects of life and how we sort of, I don't know, like react to it, I guess. There's a misconception that scientific experiments and psychological experiments kind of just tell us, oh, this is the way humans think. But I think it's much more than that. Yeah. With that in mind, like, we let, let's just put a disclaimer out there. Yeah. You know, not some results can be flawed with yes. scientific experiments because I feel like a lot of academics and psychologists especially lack intellectual humility. They kind of don't want to accept that that they might be wrong sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. I get yeah, what you mean. we don't have as many intellectually humble, curious people <laughs> yeah. um, who acknowledge that there can be cognitive blind spots sometimes, and we're not we're imperfect and imprecise. And I think a lot of the experiments kind of want to prove something all the time. Yeah, and going down that route takes away from the real lesson of what the experiment could offer. The academics are so held on to that idea that I need to be right, I need to be right. Yeah, and that sort of poses like bias, inaccuracy, all that kind of stuff. And our minds sort of don't want to admit that we're imperfect and imprecise and ignorance can sort of be invisible, which is why people repeat studies a lot and, you know, cross-examination or, like I said, other people repeat the same study. Yeah, so as we're discussing these experiments, we kind of want you to keep that in mind. Yeah. So the first experiment we're going to be talking about, do you want to sort of introduce this? I think this experiment is the most popular and one that most people have heard of, and that's the standard prison experiment. So this experiment was conducted in 1971, which I think is a very interesting time. Yes, it is because 1971 was a time of rebellion and yeah. anti-authority in a way. So this experiment, would you say it's kind of ironic that this experiment sort of took place at that time? I think it makes it more valid considering people were 
more likely to resist at that time. Oh, yeah, 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 that's a good point. So maybe the validity of it is enhanced. I don't know. Yeah. We're, we're not experts. <laughs> <laughs> so this experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment, was conducted by a social psychologist, Philip Zimbardo. I know this is such a, like, minute point and I'm nitpicking anything, everything, but it's really interesting that he's a social psychologist. So someone who studies sort of the interaction interactions between people i don't know i thought that was interesting it's interesting that a social psychologist wants to find out how people interact (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i just thought thought that was fascinating i thought i'd just add that it is it is anyways it's one it was more fascinating in my head let's move on and pretend this didn't happen okay let's explain the experiment before we talk about what he wanted to find out so Zimbardo basically put out an advert in a newspaper asking for male college students to participate in a two week, 14 day experiment in which they would sort of live in a fake prison, I guess. (laughs) In the morning, unexpectedly, the prisoners or those who were chosen to be prisoners were based on tests to see if they were like normal or not. Were were arrested outside of their homes and driven down to the police station. And then what happened? (laughs) (laughs) They were driven down the police station and they were actually blindfolded, which is which isn't what normally happens, but they were blindfolded so they could be sent to, I guess, this mock prison. And as soon as they got to this mock prison, they sort of began the degradation process. Well, it already started much earlier when they decided to arrest them in front of a bunch of people outside their own homes. Yeah, so they were stripped naked. They were they had their heads shaved off in some cases. They were deloused. Deloused, yep. Um, which actually happens in a lot of systems today. Yeah. Sort of to give this idea that they were, you know, sending their germs to the prison, already ingraining the idea that you are... Not worthy. Yes, yeah, that you're a piece It's very of dehumanizing. And, yeah, extremely. So we sort of discussed how the prisoners sort of got there, but let's talk about the guards and how they were introduced in this situation. By the way, the prisoners and guards were selected randomly. Yeah. They were even like the same height, like same body build and stuff like that, which I think is important to note. Lots of people think that wasn't the case, but that's actually like a discrepancy when people usually criticize experiment were given uniforms and um were they given weapons yeah like a baton something like that they were basically dressed the part yeah and were told that they could do whatever they want they weren't really told whatever they want but they basically didn't tell them that they couldn't do something if that makes sense they had the freedom yeah to behave in ways they thought fit yeah and in no time and this is no surprise like if you're looking at past psychological papers yeah even zimbardo said himself that he expected kind of the guards to take control and be power hungry and And really play into that role of authority it happened so quickly and so extremely yeah to the point where the experiment had to stop. Yeah. The first person who sort of like dropped out of the experiment, I would say, that was within 36 hours. And this was meant to last two weeks. I think that's the interesting part about the experiment, that it happened so quickly and drastically. And the guards became sadistic yeah and very aggressive quite quickly as soon as they wore their uniforms yeah but even i would go as fast as to say abusive there was definite abuse <laughs> yeah yeah uh do you want to explain sort of some of the stuff that the fake guards were telling their prisoners to do they were basically humiliating them yeah and degrading them so they were made to clean out toilet bowls with their bare hands and call each other names and do push-ups and Everything became a privilege, except the air that they breathe. Beds, their blankets, even their clothes on their back became a privilege. And the guards were were allowed to take everything away from them. Just the idea of being stripped naked is so degrading and humiliating. Um, And that's really interesting because they also made them, the prisoners, wear like dresses to sort of like demasculate them. Yep. And that usually doesn't happen in prisons, but it just sort of shows like the extremes that sort of went on within this sort of experiment oh you know that's so interesting i actually i read an article once of an experiment and it had nothing to do with this experiment but they made men 
wear um, dresses and women's clothes. Yeah. And they quickly saw that they acted more like women. Yeah, I think demasculating them is part of it. That, I think that sort of links to the experiment, sort of the conclusion that we got out of the experiment. Even that, what you're talking about, which we'll get to. Sort of how your environment... I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyways... So, like you said, they were basically just abusing everyone. This sort of, I feel like, raises a fundamental question about human nature. Yes, the Lucifer effect. How can ordinary students turn into vicious, sadistic guards? Or how can normal college students become spineless prisoners? Yeah, basically, how do good people turn evil? So now that we sort of went through what happened... Let's discuss this. Yeah. Let's think about the police procedures. Before the prisoners were even introduced to the guards, they were made to feel confused and fearful and dehumanized. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? It sort of creates this environment where they're sort of forced to conform to that specific role that they were given. Just the term like arrested. When you're arrested, you're put into handcuffs. You're taking away... That power. Yeah. And then you're put into an environment where there are no clocks, no windows to sort of judge the passage of time. It sort of put them into this, like, time-distorting experience with, like, limited stimulation. That would really mess with your head. Yeah, it would break a person. Yeah. And that's what happened, I guess. And then to systematically be searched and stripped naked, which happens in real life, and then de to kind of convey this idea that you have germs or you're dirty. Mm -hmm. It all links into this degradation procedure, which is designed to humiliate prisoners. It was really interesting how this sort of created two different reactions by the prisoners. Because when you think about like, oh, how I would react in this situation, I think the two ways that were sort of represented or highlighted in the experiment was really interesting because the prisoners either A, they just gave up, they're like, no way that I'm staying here, and they sort of just left, they broke down. Yeah. Or they, I guess... Conformed to these roles. Yeah. Neither is good. <laughs> um, yeah, it makes me think about real life. Those who broke down were able to be pulled out, but what happens if you break down in prison? And not everyone's committed the same crime. So exactly. It's not, it's not really fair to treat everyone the same. In a way, prison sort of works that way. And even... Yeah, prison does work that way. You listen to the guards and you're fine. But if you rebel or whatnot, then you suffer consequences. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, some of those consequences, there are people in the prison system who should not be in the prison system because they do abuse their power. And to say that those people do not exist is just ignorant, naive, I would say. Yeah, I read an article once of how... These kinds of roles attract the wrong kinds of people, the people who want to abuse that power. I don't know how accurate the article was. Yeah. It wasn't a proper study or whatever, but I thought that was interesting. That's also really interesting that you say that. That's a really good point because I did read an article where they recreated this and they sort of... I think you read it as well. I th- did I? Yeah. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> where they sort of brought up the idea how, you know, the ad itself already created this sort of bias. Yes, yeah, I remember now. So two psychologists, Thomas Carinhan and Sam McFarland, basically asked the question as to whether the wording itself sort of skewed this experiment. And so they recreated the original ad, which was sort of the control, I would say. And then they ran a separate ad saying, oh, we're going to do a psychological experiment. But they didn't include the fact that it was going to be about prison. And then they found that the people who responded to the two ads scored differently on psychological tests. So those who they thought would be participating in the prison study actually scored higher in levels of, like, aggressiveness. Authoritarianism. Yeah, like, narcissism, social... Dominance. Yeah, social dominance. Yeah. And And they... Yeah, sorry. And they actually scored lower on measures of empathy, which is interesting. Which is very interesting considering the experiment that was conducted. So I think that is, like, also a very important point to consider because you were just talking about how the people who may apply for like police work and stuff like that they do have to sort of separate their own emotions and sort of empathy to do their job sometimes 
different roles attract different type of people. We sort of went on like a tangent. Yeah, <laughs> like there's a conspiracy theory going around that business people are all psychopaths because they make decisions, like especially big businesses, they make decisions that affect so many people negatively mm -hmm. and they do it time and time again. Anyway, that's that's a completely different point. It is a completely <laughs> different point. Yeah. Anyways, back to what we were initially talking about. What I find really interesting also is that the environment was kind of designed to encourage and kind of require those behaviors. Yeah. Zimbardo himself was very open about the details and nature of his experiment. And in explaining his initial setup, he actually did say that we took steps to make sure that the prisoners knew their role and the guards also knew their role. So that comes into play as well. And I think that so sort of leads us to sort of what the experiment itself taught us. What that teaches us is that extreme behaviour kind of flows from extreme institutions. Yeah. As soon as a prisoner or guard w walks into prison, they are kind of forced into that role and the expectations are shaped by these pre-existing norms and patterns of behaviour. And I think sort of the lesson that's learnt from this, and this has been proven with other studies who sort of repeated this, they did have different results, like, you know, people didn't break down emotionally or whatnot, um, but they sort of proved the same idea that as a collective and as a unit, you were expected to behave a certain way. And it's not that any random human being, sort of what you talked about, the Lucifer effect, yeah. is capable of, you know, becoming evil. evil. It's that certain institutions and environments sort of demand those behaviours. Well, and sort of force you yeah. to assimilate to those sort of institutions to sort of fit in. A lot of the guards, after the experiment, they were interviewed and some of the guards were saying that they received a lot of criticism about their behaviour. But I don't think it's an individual criticism. We should be criticizing the actual institution, the system that yes. allowed for that behavior rather than the, than the individual. But a lot of times, even when you hear of abuse cases in institutions and things like that, people are so focused on the individual rather than why did this system allow this to happen? Exactly. I think that's the most important thing we can take away from this experiment. Don't you think we should learn from this experiment and change the way the system works? Like, There's no point in going, oh, okay, this is how humans think. We know that now and then do nothing about it. That's a very good point. Like, what is the purpose of the experiment if you're not going to implement it in real life, if you're not going to take something away from it? I think the sort of silence that comes from, you know, abuse in prison systems, because let's be honest, that exists. Exist, Everywhere, yeah. Comes from a place that sort of prisoners aren't... Human. Yeah. That prisoners deserve the abuse. Because let's be honest, most people in prison, they're usually there for, I would say, let's just like drug abuse and stuff, which are obviously bad crimes. However, most of the prison population are in there because they usually took like the wrong path in life and they're going to be, they should be rehabilitated and most of them are going to be set free. Do you get what I mean? And so you should create an environment, especially the prison system, where it's a... I would say a healthy environment. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I feel like men have it the toughest because yeah. for women's prisons, are, I feel like, are less abusive. Even though stuff happens there too, we Obviously can't deny something. that. Yeah, I We're not diminishing their experience yeah. at all or their struggle, but I feel like men have a more difficult time in prison yeah. because people expect them to put up with that abuse, especially physical abuse. There's a lot of physical abuse in prison. Exactly. And it's kind of like, you know, you're a man, deal with it. And even in, like, criminology, like, you study about victimhood and how a victim is sort of perceived as, like, older, fragile, like, female person. Yeah. And sort of the counter to that is, you know a man, which is usually the regular prison person. So I think that also plays into plays a role into that as well. Yeah, and this this is going on a tangent, but I watched this documentary on Netflix, you know, a long time ago about pregnant women in prison and, you know, they select a few who are allowed to have their babies in prison and keep them for a year. What? Yes. 
so they have their babies in prison and they're allowed to keep their babies for a year and I just thought if it was a man in prison and his wife had just given birth would they allow those extra visits for him to connect with the baby probably not <laughs> Yeah, but that's a completely... We went on a <laughs> massive tangent. We did. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, that's sort of what the psychology experiment... Those are the questions that sort of arise when we talk about that stuff, about the prison system. Yeah, but it's and not it's enough to just raise these questions, answer them and fix them. Well, we are just picking up the pieces of what people usually leave behind. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you think you would have behaved if you were... A prisoner in that situation yeah I think I would have just broke down I can't I'm too sensitive yeah I'm so paranoid I think I was chosen as a prisoner because I am weak <laughs> yeah and a lot of a lot of the prisoners actually had that perception even though we mentioned that they were just random and they were kind of the same size prisoners actually thought that the guards were chosen because they were bigger isn't that funny? Th that is funny. And it's really interesting how one of the guards or the person playing as a guard sort of told Zimbardo that he sort of felt like a puppet master. Oh, the, the scary thing is they pushed and pushed to see how much control they actually have. Yeah, because Zimbardo never said no. He never said yes either. But I think sort of that ambiguity sort of, like you said, push them, like, how far can we go? Can you imagine, I mean, like, a I, guard who is given so much power to do whatever he wants to humans that no, nobody really cares about? I mean, no, one, no one's going to miss a prisoner. Yeah. You know, especially if they're not, if they don't have family or people to check up on them or things like that. Yeah. So, although this experiment, categorically, we would say, went extremely wrong, <laughs> yeah and i i couldn't really find anything on how psychologically the people in the experiment sort of felt afterwards like a follow-up i wish they did I, that if i was the guard and i followed that kind of group think yeah idea or notion i would feel so guilty yeah me too that guilt would follow me for the rest of my life and i think i'd question whether i was actually a good or bad person but that's the thing are you a bad person or are you just following the group and are you just conforming to this in the perfect world you would resist something like that but that's why it, we're talking about psychology and human nature because we've learned that humans don't resist because some certain situations sort of demand those behaviors and i guess that sort of lies within changing the ins like you said we've said this a million times changing the institution itself Nothing. So the environment shouldn't demand those sort of behaviours. Like, I see it everywhere online. Everyone says, oh, this is creepy, this is scary. But what what are the ramifications? I feel like people are taking the wrong message away from this, like I said, where they think, oh, any person can spiral into evil. But like you said, the problem is within the institutions that allow this to happen. So basically, change the system, change the institution, and you will change the individuals within it. It's easy to say, if I were a guard, I'd never act like that, yeah. I'd never abuse someone. But people copy what others do so readily and easily. Yeah. Even even if you think you're a strong, independent person who has a mind of their own. I mean, with what was it, the Bobo doll experiment? I think that ties in. Yeah. Bobo doll, isn't it the same one that Kevin from Home Alone had? Wow, that's oddly specific. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only Bobo doll I know, the clown that he had in the shower, was yes, it? Yes, yes. Anyways, yes. <laughs> continue. I think that was in the 1960s, was it? Which is interesting because it's sort of like the same era as like the Stanford prison experiment. Yeah. Do you think because it was a time of rebellion, a social psychologist kind of wanted to see how people would conform? Social psychologists studying interactions and so and society. That's that's insane. Once again, I have to say that. Yeah. So Bandura actually made, um, decided that he's going to demonstrate how children learn behavior. But I think that applies to everyone. So he used. Um, but I think people mainly use children because they sort of see them as like a blank slate. Like society hasn't sort of got to them yet. Sort of. Do you get what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I feel like children are more willing to conform so that it's kind of not valid but oh anyway, yeah for that's the sake of the argument they made these kids watch an adult abuse poor the poor bobo doll violently then they left each child alone in a room with the doll and surprise surprise the kids began abusing the doll some quite violently and there's like video footage of this and it's sort of 
sort of scary. Yeah, and they repeated this experiment several times and they got exactly the same results. I sort yeah, of so it's not, it's not hard to kind of pick up on that behavior. I sort of have a problem with this experiment though. Yes, it went wrong because kids were abusing a doll, but I feel like the cloud itself, it was like an inflatable. Like, how else are you going to play with an inflatable? They should have got like a, a real like doll. No, but they were actually using tools to stab the doll. It wasn't just, oh, let me slap it here and there. It was actual abuse. So they they were using tools or weapons. Yeah. Uh, kids even had a gun. Wait, wait, wait. Places. Where did they get the gun from? They just a had... A fake th gun. It wasn't real. <laughs> I don't know. I know. It was a fake gun. <laughs> but I'm saying it's sort of weird that they supplied that to the kids. But I think but, that... I mean, is it surprising? Like, you show a kid... It's an adult, you know, abusing a doll, and then you leave the doll with them, and it's like, well, what do you expect me to do? I'll just copy what the adult just did. So, but that's what psycho that's what psychology experiments are. You have to sort of test out the theory. You can't just assume. Yeah, we can't just say, hey, this is what I think. I mean, some things are obvious, but you still have to test them. You have to test them and prove them. It's sort of ironic how I'm saying that, even though you're the one that taught me that sort of notion and idea. Did I? Yes. Anyways, so it sort of taught us about like learned behavior and stuff like that. But it sort of raises the question, was this ethical? I feel like with adults, if you give your consent, then yes. But even with the Stanford prison, yes, they got consent and they knew it was an experiment. But they didn't know they were going to be abused. They didn't even know they were going to be arrested in front of all their neighbours, which is so humiliating. If they arrested me, I would sue. <laughs> if they arrested me in front of my neighbours, I would seriously sue. Because it's just so humiliating. I know, but do you think the Bobo experiment was ethical? No, because it used children. I don't think children should be used in experiments. But then how do we learn about children if we don't experiment with them? <laughs> that sentence sounded so weird. <laughs> that sounded so evil. You should experiment in natural settings like you go to school oh and yeah you i get what you mean children you don't actively go seek out kids and experiment on them because you could have taught that kid aggressive behavior that would never leave them you don't know oh them. yeah that's Can, true i would not want my child in that kind of experiment would you no they could have observational studies at schools or in daycares or whatever with their parents consent I know this is like a side sort of experiment, but I thought I'd mention it because I think this was unethical, wrong, should not have happened. Basically, there were a bunch of adopted twins and they separated them. I, lots of people know about this. They separated them to sort of see the effects of, you know, separating twins. And obviously had really bad effects. Lots of them were depressed. And some of them, even after they reunited, they had so much anguish and distress over that situation that they, like, you know, took their own life. Like, that's how distressing it was. I mean, that's why back in the day, they used orphans. Because no one really wants to do that to their child. Yeah. So, oh, that is so sad. Not, to, use... make it, not to make it right, but, you like, yeah. you know... I mean, that just proves our point. You're using yeah. orphans because they basically have no one to defend them. And they can't speak out. Exactly. Which sort of leads us into this idea of consent when doing a psychological experiment. Because I think when you do a psychology experiment, you should be able to know that you're in a psychology experiment. Which let me just talk over you for a second. How I do wasn't you talk? <laughs> how do you <laughs> not know? Talking. Like if I was in a psychology experiment, not that I'm saying I'll do this, but like what if someone wants to like mess with the psychology experiment and they because they know Well with every questionnaire or experiment there's like a lie detector kind of thing. Really? Yeah. There's this thing of, you know, I'm gonna ruin your experiment. I know what's going on, but a lot of experiments actually have lie detection questions and things like that to counteract that. So I had no, no idea. idea. That's I don't know if they had them back then, but with statistical analysis and, you know, all the systems that psychologists use today, it kind of accounts for that. Okay, I did not, I did not know that. Either way, consent is very important, which sort of brings us into the next, you know what, I don't even want to call this an experiment. Would you consider this an experiment or research even? No. <laughs> Honestly, why? Like, that's all I have to say. Well, we're going to find out why because we're talking about the MK Ultra experiment. Or well, I think it's more of a project than an experiment, really. A project makes it sound nice, like, oh, 
gonna do a little project <laughs> for like my science fake, nice. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's just jump right into it. I stole Philip DeFranco's tagline. Anyways, so Project MK Ultra is a name. <laughs> it's actually a program of a collection of like heaps of illegal experiments basically on humans. They were designed and undertaken by the United States Central Intelligence Agency or AKA. The CIA. Yes. <laughs> so it was run by the CIA and it was basically coordinated with the US Army Biological Warfare Laboratories. And the reason why it was coordinated with the U.S. Army Biological Warfare Laboratories, that is a mouthful, yeah. is because during the Cold War, there were practically, we all know what the Cold War was, like, you know, Russia, yeah. the U.S. A bunch of countries bitching about each other. <laughs> yeah. They were convinced that Russia was using sort of similar tactics to sort of hypnotize U.S. soldiers so they decided to experiment with the same idea. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself with these said tactics so let's sort of explain exactly what MK Ultra was. The aim of this was to actually find something, a way or a drug, which would make people behave in a way that would bring out like deep confessions or basically wipe out your memory and <laughs> yeah. basically make you a robot agent willing to do whatever they ask of you. Yeah. So they started in 1953 with the intention to develop a drug to use in interrogations to weaken a person and force them to confess through mind control. Just the term mind control sounds so sci-fi and almost fake, yeah. honestly. Yeah. And they mainly used LSD. However, this was not limited to this. They used other drugs like cocaine and DMT, amphetamines. Barbiturates. Yeah, so a lot of other drugs were used. It's funny because the subjects were like... Mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, sex workers, people who already had a clear problem and couldn't fight back. So that brings the validity into question because they didn't exactly get a clean slate. Yeah. So they mainly sort of worked with LSD. Yeah, what is that? Can you explain that to us? You're the you're the pharmacist here. <laughs> Zara kind of knows a lot about drugs. Don't ask me how, but yeah, can you explain what <laughs> LSD is? Okay, so LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide, I did not say that correctly. Yeah. It's basically a chemical which is sort of low key a fungus. It's sort of disgusting. But, anyways, LSD belongs to a really nice group called hallucinogens or psychedelics. So, when small doses are taken, you can, like, you know, create changes in perceptions, your mood and thought. However, when you take a really large dose, you can produce sort of, like, visual hallucinations, distortions of space and time. LSD is also known amongst the streets as acid. <laughs> so, so some of the effects... Should we talk about the effects? Well, of you just had this information up your sleeve. <laughs> I promise I do not take drugs. Anyways... <laughs> What happens if I take too much LSD? Is it first of all is it addictive? You know what? There anything can be addictive if you think about it. I don't think it is though. Uh, I, you well, do get some sort of you do get some sort of a high from it and I think that in itself is sort of addictive. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, but it's not I don't think it's as as addictive as cocaine and those drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or heroin. Anyways, so it, Oh, it's not addictive. Do you know how I know? How? Because I read a study where they fed rats cocaine and they, they actually came back for the cocaine because they were addicted until they died. But then they put LSD on the cocaine and the rat took it once and didn't really come back for it. So okay. some of the symptoms are, you know, euphoria, your pupils obviously dilate, we all know that. Seeing and hearing things, so obviously hallucinations. However, you can also be extremely confused, you vomit... And if you essentially sort of take too much, it can cause panic, paranoia. It can also increase your risk-taking, which we'll get to. Yeah. And also you can develop psychosis. And also bad trips, I think. Yep. And bad trips can actually cause, like I said, increased risk-taking. And some people even, like, it's seen that they attempt self-harm. Like when they go down a bad trip. Especially after like disturbing hallucinations. and Given to 
the wrong people, it's very dangerous. And even the coming down period of LSD is just as bad. You get insomnia, you have fatigue, and basically your body and muscles sort of ache. And you can also, a symptom of like the coming down period is depression, yeah, which is quite that, extreme. Yeah, which is why a lot of people are actually, a lot of people were upset about this study, obviously for obvious reasons. But also the fact that this dangerous drug was administered without the subject's or the participant's knowledge or informed consent, which is actually a violation of the Nuremberg Code, which the US has agreed to, I think. They unconsenting, unconsentingly, is that a word? <laughs> administered, like you said, this drug to a bunch of people. And I'm not just saying a bunch of people as in a bunch of people. I mean like from students to people within the CIA themselves, like their own team, if you would if you would call it that. Yeah. Um, like you said, just random people, whoever they could get their hands on, basically. And, a lot and of this is even more disturbing since, like, after World War II, everyone was so horrified by the human experimentation done by the Nazis. Yeah. And to do that so soon after that, yeah, it's quite horrifying. Yeah, and like you said, after the Nuremberg trials and they sort of created, you know, sort of codes and regulations, there were clear rules about what was considered legal and what was not considered legal when you were going to be experimenting, especially with humans. So to do something like that, so horrific, and without consent, is just a psychological experiment that is extremely wrong. Not only went wrong, but extremely wrong. But how did it go wrong? I wonder what happened. Just going off what you just said yeah. about, you know, just finding people randomly. At first, it was actually used on everyone in technical services. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? Oh, Judith from photocopying, come up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Let's test this LSD on you. Well, I mean, it wasn't controlled at all. Is it really an experiment? No, there was no variable. They were giving it to like random people. It was it was all over the place. It was so messy. And what this um, experiment involved was two people in a room basically, and they observed each other for hours and took notes. That's it. Like you administer LSD, you take notes. That was the experiment. But then, as the experiment progressed, they started using outsiders. Like they were drugging outsiders with no explanation and. They had like surprise acid trips. Yeah, only because it was becoming a hazard like in the workplace. Like these surprise acid trips, they're like, you know, we shouldn't be doing this in the office anymore. Maybe it's a bit unprofessional. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it became an occupational hazard and safety thing. <laughs> so they took it to the streets, which is uh, insane. I know. Like it was so dangerous in the office, you decided to open the doors into the world. Like, I, mm. I don't know, how do these people think? And of course, like adverse reactions happen. Yep. For example, an operative who received the drug in his morning coffee, could you, could you imagine that? He literally became psychotic and ran across Washington and he explained that he was seeing a monster in every single car passing him. And possibly one of the worst effects is that there was a doctor called Dr. Frank Olson. He was an army scientist. He had never taken LSD before. And he essentially, after a surprise trip, like we said, that coming down period, he went into a deep depression and he fell from a 13th story window. So and even then they didn't he, stop. Yeah, he was basically murdered, I think. That's murder. That is murder. And so, you know, after a person literally died, you know, the researchers, the MK Ultra researchers, which I don't think they should even be called that, sort of later said, you know what, LSD is too unpredictable. So they sort of gave up on the idea that LSD was, you know, the secret that was going to unlock the universe. That's literally what they said, quote by quote. However, they decided to develop a series of super hallucinogens, which sounds like a super villain name. Yeah. Super hallucinogen. <laughs> and they thought that would hold sort of a greater promise for mind control. This obviously like resulted in lack of support for these, a lot of these academics and researchers, if you call them that. And LSD kind of was forgotten about, I think. It wasn't as big a priority altogether, which I think is the issue. I think that's where the experiment kind of really messed up. Like, so many people lost their lives. 
could you have at least taken something away from the experiment? <laughs> yes. So could we have at least learned something? And a lot of these results were destroyed by the CIA after the government panicked by Watergate. So they just destroyed everything. And in 1974, the New York Times sort of alleged that this happened, but it wasn't until 1975 where sort of the Rockefeller Commission and the church, the Congressional Church Committee reports sort of revealed to the public for the first time yet that yes, this did indeed happen. And so a bunch of people obviously filed a bunch of lawsuits, but we have to remember that, you know, for example, Frank Olson's family got like $750,000, which isn't going to bring a life back, yeah. by the way. No, but like so. I said, lots of people were suing them. However, lots of people that these experiments were conducted on were from low social socioeconomic backgrounds. And so, especially, this was done to like a lot of like African American communities, especially that I researched. Yeah. And so they didn't really seek out any sort of I mean, retribution. They yeah, they chose their subjects very well and opportunistically because yeah. a lot of them couldn't fight back, and the government aggressively tried to avoid legal liability. And what it sort of poses the question of what. Did they do so aggressively? I mean, I know. I mean, if they had the means to drug people without their consent, we could be thinking about blackmail, murder. I don't know. Yeah. Like, how did they? How did they stop people filing lawsuits and going after them? Since this is quite a thematic uh, segment, we're sort of talking about psychology experiments that went wrong. If we look at the Stanford Prison Experiment, yes, it went wrong. But I think it sort of made progress, would you say, within the psychology community? It taught us, I mean, a lot of the principles of conformity. However, with NK Ultra, it was an experiment that went wrong. However, I think it took us backwards in a lot of aspects. Can you imagine the information that we could have gotten about its therapeutic implications? Especially with, you know, psychedelics and hypnosis and how that could be used in medicine. Yeah. I mean, if it was done right, if it was controlled properly, we would have massive progress in the medical field. Yeah. But because there were, there's now a stigma attached to LSD, after the LSD incident, people stopped, A, experimenting with the drug yeah. in controlled settings, and it became harder to even get approved. Yeah. If you want to do research, it kind of ruined it for people who were doing the right thing. Which is sad because we, we now know that LSD can actually be used for good. Like people who are terminally ill or have PTSD or depression. I actually read that people, for example, depression, when they use LSD within like obviously a controlled setting, they found direct evidence that psychedelics cause like structural and functional changes in like your neurons. And it sort of acts like a reset button for the brain like brain circuits and stuff like that even now there are very few tools to help people who are dealing with a terminally ill diagnosis like cancer yeah. the, these patients could you know get into depression and be extremely distressed and lsd has proven to be able to help them with that i mean it's it's really difficult to be able to help someone prepare to die Ooh, they get me chills. Yes, it's, I mean, end-of-life care consists of supportive counselling and pharmaceutical treatments like antidepressants and things like that. But most medications, even with psychotherapy, take months to work yeah. and are not as effective. So things like LSD, which is not addictive, can give them that kind of fresh perspective yeah and can give them a positive outlook on what's left in their life yeah which is extremely important and like you said it sort of added to sort of the stigma because let's be honest lsd does have a stigma and just like any drug just like any other antidepressants or whatnot it does not work for everyone but the thing is it does work for some people and because of mk ultra and that whole big incident it sort of stifled research. research. Yeah. For dramatic effect, I was going to be like, and that was their biggest crime. Then I realized someone literally died. And I was like, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> yeah. One of the patients in an article talked about how 
he was able to he had this incredible experience where his ego or sense of self dissolved completely and he saw himself in a completely new light isn't that amazing wow and it made him for the first time realize that he's not his ego and he was able to push past his ego and everything he thought about life and when I die I'm going to this is going to happen and I'm going to leave this behind and actually saw this situation in a fresh perspective yeah and I think that gives you gives back some sort of control for yourself and I feel like that's what a lot of people like suffering with like mental illness feel like they lack sort of that control yes like I'm pretty sure psychotherapy would not be able would not be able to achieve that kind of result so LSD is extremely important. It's so sad that it was put off for so many years and it's helping out so many people now. I mean, that doesn't mean there's no risk. Yeah, of course not. Because the risks are psychological. <laughs> yeah. But when used carelessly, I think, but under a doctor's guidance. Yeah, so I'm not telling you, you know, if you want to separate from your ego, go take an LSD. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's still an extremely dangerous drug and... Yeah, it's only given to terminally ill patients. Like any other drug. Yeah. And sort of what MK Ultra sort of researched and stuff, it sort of raises this question about using information for either good or evil. Not to be that black and white, but there is like recent research that does prove that LSD boosts people's sort of suggestibility. And it sort of raises the question as to that piece of information like you said, could have been used for people who actually needed it as opposed as opposed to sort of weaponizing a drug that can actually yeah. do good oh, in yeah. certain circumstances. Definitely. And this example is so cliche, but I can't think of anything else. Like Einstein didn't set out to create the atomic bomb. Yeah. But yeah, he, unfortunately that's what happens sometimes. And, you know, these sort of, and because of MK Ultra, these regulatory restrictions were sort of imposed around like the mid 60s and it sort of just slammed shut the door onto this sort of research and there was it, like you said it was so difficult to get like licensing for this and like pre peer-reviewed articles were like to sort of do everything was just a lot more difficult yeah for I mean, researchers you, that were actually you, invested yeah. in this if you were a researcher interested in psychedelics it became almost impossible to get a license yeah. Because people were so traumatized and just LSD has such a stigma to it. Yeah. I think the number one rule, especially when you're like a psychologist or a doctor or pharmacist, whatever you are, like the number one rule is to do no harm. Yes. And to just like throw that away is so... It's Maybe gross. a lot of harm. Which sort of brings us, sadly or happily, depending on how you feel, to the end of the podcast. As horrible as these experiments were... It all taught not only us, but like, you know, sort of humanity a lesson. I think individuals should take away from these experiments. Like a lot of these experiments are seen as horrifying, but instead I feel like it should be used as a tool to kind of investigate our own selves and our own behavior. Yeah. Horrible results are still results at the end of the day. Yeah, and which is a twisted way to look at it, sort of. Do you know what these experiments make me think about? Well, what experiments are being done today that we don't know about? That we don't know about yet. Like when you log on to Facebook, or oh, now I just I'm not trying to instill fear into anyone, but when you log on to all these social accounts, like it makes me wonder and think: Is there someone out there that's trying to collect all my information? I mean, there are. <laughs> they definitely are. Mark what Zuckerberg are they for? admitted to it. Yeah. What if we're in an we're in, we're probably in an experiment right now. We're living in a simulation. That's your own theory. <laughs> that is my own theory <laughs> that I just imposed on everyone, <laughs> uh, which I think is a great way to sort of end off this segment. Always be aware and stand outside of yourself and kind of let go of your ego. I think that's when people really rise and become an individual. Wow, that got deep. I didn't know this became a TED talk. <laughs> Speaking of questioning, if I have a question for you. If people actually took the time to listen to all of this, what word should they comment down below? It's your turn this week. I'm no, don't, I'm I already had my turn last week. It's your turn. Okay, I'm going to make the word static 
because our podcast used to have like static as the video but then everyone complained that they were having migraines so you just got a still image this week so if you reach the end of the episode comment something about the static or something i don't know the word static that's so oddly specific specific (laughs) uh that's another podcast this is me zara signing off and this is Nora also signing off. Goodbye. When, when you hear the heart snap, it means you're done. <laughs> 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 <laughs>